of bigger waters and the increases that some of our people are seeing in their primary home, Senator, as well as their businesses. Madam President, I thank my colleague from Louisiana for asking that question. And what I'm hearing from Mississippi and what I think we're going to be hearing from all across the United States of America is, is that this is about to be a disaster for property owners uh, in the United States of America. And so I join my colleagues today, and perhaps there'll be others besides the three of us on the floor, uh, in saying we need to address the very real problem of increases in flood insurance premiums, which will unfairly hurt homeowners and businesses in my home state of Mississippi and across the United States of America. Uh, and I appreciate my colleague for uh, presenting the map to show that this is indeed a national problem and not just a regional or coastal problem. The severe onset of unaffordable rates, unaffordable rates, could have a devastating impact on the livelihood of homeowners and communities throughout the nation and on our economy. Uh, moreover, they could jeopardize the long-term solvency of the National Flood Insurance Program, which covers some 5.6 million uh, Americans. There's no doubt that NFIP faces enormous challenges. The damages wrought by storms like Katrina, Rita, and Sandy have left the NFIP in the red for nearly a decade, amounting to nearly $24 billion at the last count. In the early years of NFIP, when bad storm years were roughly offset by light storm years, taxpayers effectively carried policyholders through tough years because of NF NFIP's authority to borrow from the Treasury. However, the catastrophic 2004-2005 hurricane seasons put the program more than $20 billion in debt and disproved the notion that the finances would balance out over time. The principles for NFIP reform are worthy goals. Premiums need to reflect risk more accurately. Flood risk must be projected and mapped more accurately. And the purchase of flood insurance needs to be encouraged and enforced in order to enlarge the risk pool. We cannot expect the NFIP to continue as a viable program without addressing the huge imbalance between premium revenue and payments for losses. But at the same time, Congress cannot sit by in the face of these dramatic uh, unaffordable rate increases facing many Americans. The manner in which these reforms are being implemented is alienating the very people the program is intended to help. The new rates penalize people who have followed the rules and places the heaviest burden on those who are just now recovering from recent disasters. In communities still recovering from recent Mississippi River flooding and uh, in communities along the Gulf Coast where the aftermath of Katrina still lingers, a financial burden of this magnitude could force homeowners either to leave their property unprotected or to move away altogether. Ensuring the long-term success of the NFIP means taking an honest look at how the reforms Congress enacted last year are being implemented and whether they are unfairly hurting citizens, and I contend Madam President, that they are. Allowing rates to go from a few hundred dollars to tens of thousands of dollars is hardly a reasonable approach to reform. Reform should not be unnecessarily painful, unfair, or counterproductive to the goal of solvency. Premium increases that make the coverage literally unaffordable could lead to a net loss in program revenue. Nobody benefits from that. Nobody, nobody benefits, neither the homeowner nor the taxpayer, when NFI premium uh, increases result in foreclosure. I'm concerned that NFIP may well have overestimated net revenue increases. They may have underestimated the burden of the program going forward. That alone would be a good reason to delay the increases. If a longer phase-in would result in a net increase in revenue, to the program as I suspect it would. A delay would also allow time to study the effects of premium increases. And it would allow us as policymakers to look for less harmful approaches to reform. The Federal Emergency Management Agency should be able to complete 
and affordability study and ensure that its technologies and methodologies accurately assess risk. And so I thank my colleague from Louisiana. I thank my colleague from Florida for joining us. And I urge all of my colleagues, Madam President, to support action that provides immediate relief to Americans facing these steep rate hikes. Madam President, I thank the Senator from um, Mississippi for his comments and engaging in this uh, exchange on the floor this morning. I see the Senator from Florida here, and I know he's been particularly concerned because Florida has, of course, a um, very robust population, one of our largest states. And I think, Senator, you have over two million policies uh, in Florida. And could you, uh, through the chair, I'd like to ask what you're hearing in Florida um, about uh, this situation. Uh, Madam President, uh, I thank uh, the Senator from Louisiana for inquiring. And I can tell you that uh, federal flood insurance that's not affordable is not federal flood insurance. And to go from a position that you're paying rates here and all of a sudden to go to a position there, uh, people are completely priced out of the market. And all the ancillary things that go with it, because of that, people can't sell their homes. Uh, and when you put that ripple effect through the entire economy, especially in a state like mine that has more uh, coastline than any uh, state save for Alaska, and where we have 40 percent of all the health, the, the, for some reason health insurance is on my mind, <laughs> all of the insurance policies for flood, uh, 40 percent of them are in Florida. And so I, I dealt with this. Uh, I would say to the senator from Louisiana because in my former life I was the elected insurance commissioner of Florida. Now fortunately I had no jurisdiction over the federal flood insurance program, but other insurance companies that offered it privately or supplemented the federal flood insurance, we did have jurisdiction to regulate. People cannot build a house if they're going to a bank to get a mortgage unless they have flood insurance. Now that the maps, as the senator has pointed out, have been expanded, showing there are a lot more areas that are inundated by water, by flood, at times of the year, then this becomes, for the engine of commerce, this becomes a critical component. And you just can't be going along charging here and suddenly say we're going to charge you four times as much. So let's have a little common sense. And a little common sense says we want FEMA to do an affordability study. And in the meantime, until we get back that study, we want this put on hold. It doesn't say that it's not going to go up in the future, but availability of insurance is directly proportional to the ability of people to pay for that insurance and to continue the American dream which home ownership is. So, <laughs> I would say to the senator from Louisiana, remember how long we've been trying to get this going? And to the great credit of the senator from Louisiana who has taken the lead on this, because she saw the problem early on, before people started complaining in my state and many other states, they were complaining in the state of Louisiana. And the senator, Senator Landrieu, was on top of it. But it's like we've only been doing this for eight months. All right, we've got a vehicle on the floor that is a must-pass vehicle. It's the defense authorization bill. We need to get this legislation amended onto it and get it signed into law. I thank the 
senator from Louisiana, and I thank uh, the presiding officer. I thank the senator from Florida. He's so right about the urgency of this. As you know, Madam President, in your own home state, you're hearing from people who um, really are stuck literally between a rock and a hard place because they can't get their insurance renewed, they can't get afford the premium increases, and so if they were thinking about selling their home, their home basically has become literally worthless, losing what equity they have temporarily, we hope, because we intend to fix this because no one can purchase their home if the flood insurance went from $300 a year to $13,000 or $15,000 a year. So it's really affecting um, home ownership. That is why I'm proud to say, and I see the senator from Mississippi, I'm going to ask him in just a moment. Proud, yes, I'm sorry. Would, uh, Madam President, may I do an administrative thing? I forgot to request unanimous consent that B.B. Lang, a defense fellow assigned to our office, be granted privileges of the floor for the purpose of the defense bill. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I see the senator from Mississippi on the floor, and I want to ask him while I'm saying how grateful I am to the great coalition of senators that have come together, 24 senators now, and 128 House members. In addition, we have the National Association of Realtors, the National Association of Home Builders, and the Independent Community Bankers. I wanted to ask the Senator from Mississippi, do you think we have a better chance of getting attention for our bill, uh, Senator, with the national strong support of the Realtors, the Home Builders, and the Bankers, and what are you hearing from them in your state of Mississippi? Mr. President, if this distinguished Senator would yield, I'd be happy to respond. Um, it's a fact that the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act, which we are discussing, uh, seeks to protect homeowners from increases in the cost of flood insurance premiums until the administration reviews and reports to the Congress on the flood mapping technologies and methodologies and insurance affordability that are being issued under the authority of existing laws. One problem that uh, we're concerned about is that the program was supposed to protect taxpayer investments, communicate perceived flood risk to homeowners, and encourage communities to protect themselves against flood risks. The reform legislation enacted in 2012 made some positive changes in the program. Today, some of those changes are now working in opposition to the broader goals of reform, hence the importance of this legislation. These shortcomings in, existed in the law, and they actually threatened to weaken the flood insurance program. The success of flood insurance is so important to uh, many inland and coastal states such as mine and in Louisiana, where the distinguished senator is from. Communities there continue to work to overcome damages caused by the greatest natural disaster in our nation's history, the effects of the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010, and now skyrocketing flood insurance premiums. Under the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act, the administration would be required to provide assurances to Congress that it is using sound map mapping methods to make flood insurance rate determinations. A study by the National Academies of Science produced in March of this year has called into question some of the engineering practices the government uses to determine rates. Before allowing unaffordable flood insurance rates to devalue private property and harm local communities and economies, we should be absolutely sure the government's engineering practices and procedures are as sound as possible. It will be very difficult to rebuild communities or restore home equity once they are lost. So we had better get it right. Our bill does not create new programs to address rising premiums. It simply leaves in place some current practices 
so that we can make sure that the productive reforms we enacted last year will actually improve the credibility of the program among communities and homeowners. Our bill would not affect positive reforms related to expanding program participation or the phase out of subsidized flood insurance premiums for vacation homes and homes that have a history of, of repeated flooding. Uh, and my principal purpose of coming to the floor was to thank the distinguished senator from Louisiana for her leadership as she continues to be our uh, out front person in dealing with some of the very challenging uh, facts and decisions that are coming from those who are trying to improve the program at the f federal level, but also at the state and local level. That's where the action is. And uh, it, I'm happy to join her in this plea to the Senate today. Madam President, I thank the um, distinguished senator from Mississippi and really appreciate his hard work as well as his staff on this issue. It's been a real uh, team effort, and um, without him, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I thank the senator. I see the senator from Massachusetts who was scheduled um, next in this colloquy, and she's brought a sp particularly spectacular view, a uh, different view, and a much needed view from the East Coast, and not only in light of the devastation from Hurricane Sandy, but the ongoing um, challenges to that region. I want to ask unanimous consent, it's 1230, we were supposed to end, but I think if each of us take about four minutes in the order of Senator Warren, then Senator Hoven, then Senator Merkley, four minutes each, and we could then um, recess for lunch as was required earlier. But through the chair, I wanted to ask the senator from Massachusetts. Is what, there objection? Without objection. What is she hearing at home from, you know, the people of Massachusetts about this? And how important do you think it is, Senator, for us to have the support of the realtors and the home builders and other national organizations that understand the dire consequences if we're not able to get some of these fixes in place? Well, I want to thank the Senator from Louisiana. I want to thank her for the question. I most of all want to thank her for her energetic leadership on this issue. Uh, she's going to help us find the right way here. I'm here today because of what I'm hearing from families in Massachusetts. Uh, and I also want to thank the senator from Mississippi. You know, this is a reminder. This is something that's hitting us all around the country, this change in the flood maps. So I'm here today to support my colleagues' bipartisan efforts to help homeowners across the country who are getting hit with newly revised flood maps and increased flood insurance premiums. Families purchase flood insurance to prevent the loss of their homes during a natural disaster. But now, many of these same families fear that the price of flood insurance could be just as devastating and actually cost them their homes. I understand why Congress changed the National Flood Program to more accurately reflect the true costs and the risks of flood damage. And I agree that over time, we need to move to a more market-based system for setting flood insurance rates, provided we adequately take into account affordability concerns for working families. But this is not what's happening right now. These new maps and rate increases are having as big an impact as a big storm. When FEMA released these flood maps earlier this year and last, they knew they were placing hundreds of thousands of homeowners into a flood zone for the very first time. And yet, there was inadequate warning to homeowners. Many have started receiving letters from their mortgage company and are learning for the first time that they must now purchase flood insurance. These new premiums, we've heard about the cost, $500, $1,000 a month, even more. Most hardworking families and most seniors don't have that kind of extra money on hand to spend on flood insurance premiums that they never knew they needed. One Massachusetts resident wrote to me with this, I have owned my property for over 33 years. 12 years ago, I built a house according to the codes at the time. 
Recently, the flood maps were redrawn, putting my home in a new flood zone and out of compliance. The implementation of the Bigger Waters Act is going to raise our flood insurance to $10,000 or more every year. I follow the rules, and now the rules are changing, leaving me few options to comply. Now, the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act that I have co-sponsored along with Senator Landrieu and so many others will provide relief to this homeowner and others who built to code and were later remapped into a higher risk area. This critical bill will delay rate increases until FEMA completes affordability studies mandated by Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act and until subsequent affordability guidelines are enacted. You know, there's a second problem with FEMA's actions. Reclassifications have taken place in some areas without a careful and complete analysis. But for those who believe they haven't been correctly classified, it's a tough challenge to get their flood zone status changed. I received another letter from the Massachusetts constituent who lives in Brockton. She was informed that her only way out of this mess was to pay more than $1,000 for an engineer to come and conduct an elevation study of a nearby brook. Now, let's be clear about this. She has to spend this money, even though the city of Brockton and the nearby Army Corps of Engineers have no record of the brook ever flooding. And if her appeal is successful, she's still out $1,000 due to FEMA's mistake. Ah, then I will just say I am pleased to join my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to call for this common sense delay, which will give FEMA time to get this right. And I thank Senator Landrieu for her leadership in this, Senators Menendez, Isaacson, Cochran, and all the co-sponsors of this bill. Time is running out. We need to get this done. I yield back. Madam President, thank you so much. Senator Hoven has joined us, and he's been particularly forceful on the issue of basements in a state that doesn't have an ocean anywhere around it, but has some serious uh, flooding uh, challenges, and I would hope the Senator would take a minute to explain to everyone what he's been telling us and how important this particular piece of this bill is uh, for the basement situations in your state. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to thank the uh, good Senator from Louisiana. Very pleased to join in this colloquy uh, with my co-sponsors in this uh, very important res uh, legislation. This is about uh, affordability of home ownership. American dream is about home ownership. Always has been. We want to make sure that continues. So it is about affordability, but it's also about getting it right. Look, if we're going to reset flood insurance rates, we need to get it right. This affects people across this great nation. It affects their ability to own and continue to own their own home. We need to make sure as we make this transition, which we're all working on, we're all working on it, we get it right. And uh, so that's why you see this legislation as bipartisan uh, legislation, and we urge our colleagues to join us in this effort. Um, this is about home ownership. This is about affordability. This is about getting it right. And to the point that the uh, good senator from Louisiana just made, Madam President, as you know, in the great state of North Dakota, we have the Red River Basin, we have the Cheyenne River Basin, we have the James River Basin, we have the Missouri River Basin, the Devil's Lake Basin, and more. So we know flooding, and we've seen it from year to year. One of the provisions, and there's a number of provisions in this bill which you've already identified, critically important. I'm not going to repeat that, but I really want to focus for just a minute on the basement exemption. Now, legislation to preserve the basement exemption was included in the Hoven Heidkamp Flood Safe Basement Act, Senate Bill 1601. That's been incorporated into this bill. And as sponsors, we appreciate that very much because this is a collaborative effort, again, to get it right as we make this transition in flood insurance rates and make sure that we protect affordability on a fair basis as we move to financial viability for the long term for flood insurance rates. But when a homeowner has put the cost into making sure 
that they have a flood-proof basement, if we don't take that into account in the insurance rates, we are penalizing them and we are charging them twice. Makes no sense. Makes no sense at all. That's why we've got to have the basement exemption continued in this legislation. And that's why as sponsors, on a bipartisan basis, we're not only pursuing this as standalone legislation, but we're also introducing it as an amendment to the Defense Authorization Bill or other legislation that can move, because we need to address it. We need to address it now. Uh, Madam President, as you well know, the mayor of a small community in northeast North Dakota, which has seen repeated flooding, contacted our congressional delegation and said, hey, look, What's going on with FEMA right now is they're changing these flood insurance rates, and we have examples of homeowners that are going from less than $1,000 a year to more than $5,000 a year, a five-fold increase. And you know what? Not a new home. Home's been there a long time, and it's never been flooded. Never been flooded. And they're going to go from less than 1000 to 5000 in a home that's been there for a long time and never been flooded? That's not how this is supposed to work. That's not how it's supposed to work. And that's why we need this legislation. So again, I want to thank uh, the good senator from Louisiana, all of our sponsors. And we have a great bipartisan group going already, and, and we uh, urge our colleagues to join us and we uh, urge them to join us without delay. We, we seek a common objective. We will adjust the flood insurance rates to make sure the program is viable for the long term, but we need to get it right, and that's what this is all about. Uh, I yield the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, we've all been extremely uh, helpful, of course, as a team in bringing this issue forward and crafting the bill, but literally we would not be here if it weren't for the leadership of the subcommittee chairman who has jurisdiction over this issue and if he would not have said yes when we asked him for a hearing in his committee to just allow us to present the facts in hopes that we could find a way of as all of us have said senator um, finding a way to make this program self-sustainable the taxpayer but helpful to the people that need it twin goals both which must be met or there won't be any program because no one will afford be able to afford to be in it so, Senator, thank you for getting that so quickly, and uh, you're the last one on our colloquy. And again, what are you hearing from home, and can you give us, as chair of the subcommittee, some insight into how you think this is going to affect real estate markets if we're not able to, uh, through the chair, if we're not able to fix this? Thank you. I thank my colleague from Louisiana for her tireless efforts in, in this regard. And we can tell from the commentaries that have just been put forward, we've had a senator from Massachusetts, a senator from Mississippi, a senator from North Dakota, Louisiana, of course, and, and now representing Oregon. And these are folks representing uh, blue states and red states and all types of different terrain, and they have the common purpose of addressing the dysfunction in the bigger waters bill that was passed. And just to give you a small feeling for this, we have a family in Oregon, the Hay family from Eagle Creek. They wanted to sell their home. They had a nice young couple with solid financials that wanted to buy it, and it was all approved except for the insurance policy. And it, from the couple found out that the insurance policy would not be the $500 that the current family is paying, but $5,000 a year, the deal fell apart. Because for every $1,000 that you pay in flood insurance, the value of a home drops by $20,000. So not only is the, the couple who wanted this home unable to, to buy it uh, because of the home value has dropped, but the family that owns a home, that had equity in the home, that hoped to take these funds into retirement, be their nest egg, they have lost that, that nest egg due to these outrageous additional costs, these these, these dramatic, dramatic uh, increases. And so point of sale is, is one particular problem and has a big impact on the real estate market. But we also have the situation of somebody who has a policy lapse. Maybe you think your mortgage company is paying the policy and maybe they think you're paying it and maybe it defaults for a few days when you find out that neither one has paid the bill. Well, suddenly you might be going in that situation from $500 to, to $5,000. 
Or perhaps your mortgage company has never enforced the provision that you're required to get flood insurance. And now they, they check their records, and they're checking their records because they are now being charged a fine, a significant multi-thousand dollar fine, if they do not check their records, and you should have flood insurance under the law, but you don't. So they check their records and contact you. Well, now you're facing this unsubsidized rate as a new policy. And so uh, we have all of this, and then layered on top of it is the fact that across this nation, the flood zones are being remapped. So folks who were outside of the 100 years and have been outside and had their home 15 years are suddenly getting notified that they're inside the flood zone and required by their mortgage company to get a policy. And they may say, but you know, wait, I looked at the map and only the corner of my property is in the flood zone and my house isn't. Well, the mortgage company says, well, we're sorry, you have to get this and you have to then prove you're not in the flood zone and it may cost you thousands of dollars to get an elevation survey and be able to demonstrate that you're outside the flood zone. You carry this burden of proof. Uh, so this is a big challenge. And we should recognize how uncertain, what an art form it is to establish these 100-year zones. Because a company comes in and does a model, and they say, well, a 100-year flood will look like this. And this, what tributary, what watershed that contributes to the confluence of creeks is going to end up flooding that particular town? And based on their model, the flood zone might look like it's in the eastern section of the town or the western section of the town or so on and so forth. And that uncertainty where just inches can change whether you're not in a hundred year or outside a hundred year. And some of these areas are very flat. A few inches water rise can cover many additional square miles. And this can have a huge impact on our business districts. Because what business wants to reinvest in a business district when now they feel that any improvements that they make are going to be an area where no one else is going to want to buy their company because they're now in a situation where they have unaffordable flood insurance. So this is why we've come together, Democrats and Republicans, states from the north and the south and the west and the east, coming together to say we must change this situation that is creating so much unfairness and economic damage. And I'm delighted as the, the chair of the subcommittee to be fully engaged in partnering in this. And I think, again, a special thanks to my colleague from Louisiana who is doing such a, a fine job uh, championing this issue. I thank the senator. Our time has come to an end. And just in conclusion, um, Madam Chair, I really thank the senator from Oregon, again, the subcommittee chair for his leadership. I also want to um, particularly thank Senator Menendez and Senator Isaacson, the two lead sponsors of this bill, who have come together to provide the leadership to move this bill forward, and they will be looking for a vehicle. We filed it on this bill in the event we have an opportunity for an amendment on the defense bill. If not, we'll be looking for the next possible opportunity, and I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for your co-sponsorship um, and your leadership for North Dakota. I want to just, in conclusion, to put this map up here because this is a map of all the counties that have levees. I was so surprised when I saw this map. Now, I'm very familiar with the levees in Louisiana. I've helped to build a lot of them. And I'm very familiar with the Mississippi River generally because we have so much commerce along the Mississippi. So I'm kind of generally familiar with Missouri and Illinois and Arkansas, but this is what really just stood out for me was the, the levee systems in Montana and in Arizona and in California. Now, a lot of these are levees, um, dikes and dams that are different from the river levees that we see, but look at Pittsburgh and look at New York uh, and North Dakota here and Montana and Washington. I mean, there is not a place in this country, not on the coast, not in the interior, that doesn't have a threat of flooding. Either a levee can break, a dam can break, um, a river can overflow, there can be flash flooding because of droughts. Even in Texas, uh, where there's a lot of flash flooding, and on, not only on the coast, but inland as well, Kansas. So the conclusion is, this is a real challenge for our whole nation. We have a bill led by Senator Menendez and Senator Isaacson that cost zero, scores zero. 
We have written this bill in a way that it just postpones these draconian rate increases so that we can take a little bit more time to get this right, to study it, to do some modeling, and to get it right. This bill was passed prematurely. It was passed, I know, with very good intentions, but it was passed prematurely without the data we need to make smart decisions for our communities. And so this is just giving us time to get it right. There's zero cost the way this bill is structured. And um, I really appreciate, uh, again, the courtesies of the um, managing, uh, the our leader managing this bill on the floor. And I yield back our time. Under the previous order, the Senate stands in recess until 2.15 p.m.